Global unemployment has reached 200 million. And millions of people that still have their jobs find themselves in a position where their weekly pay has been cut dramatically. We have businesses that close every day. In China alone, 500,000 businesses closed, never to open again. We have seniors who have looked forward to graduation for 13 years and they're awakening to a new reality that it will look drastically different than they had ever imagined. We have classmates that uh, will never be able to say goodbye to their friends. They'll never be in the same room again. They'll never be able to hug each other. There's a lot of losses that are being experienced around the world. We have family, family members, husbands and wives that are, are separated right now. People that maybe live in uh, really dangerous jobs, so they, they live apart so that they don't spread the virus to the rest of the family. Or we have people that have jobs that put them in different countries and borders are now closed. So that they're living in different countries and different time zones. Uh, we're living in some really dark times. I mean, the death toll itself, 200,000 and rising deaths of babies, those deaths of mothers and fathers, sons, daughters, lonely deaths, people dying in a hospital bed with no one by their side because they're not allowed into the hospital, no one to hold their hand as they breathe their last breath. These are dark days for all of us around the world. But the hope is that God gives us songs to sing during dark days. And the Psalms are some of the greatest songs that God has given us to sing. Today, we find ourselves in Psalm 115. It's a psalm that is birthed out of dark days. And we don't really know for sure what was going on in Israel at the time when Psalm 115 was penned. Uh, was it an economic crisis? Was it a famine? Were they defeated in some battle? Was it exile that they were carried off? Was, what, what was going on? We don't really know. And I think that's probably a good thing. If we knew what their specific situation was, we could probably say, well, that's not me. That's not my situation. But the generality of their dark days allows us today to look into their situation and say, yeah, this is us. This is my reality. And the psalmist in those dark days, living in darkness with the rest of Israel, speaks through the darkness to the people of God. And he encourages them to trust the Lord, to seek the glory of God above all things, to fall on your knees and praise to him. And if we listen to the psalmist, he speaks to us today as well. He speaks into our pain, into our suffering. He speaks to our situation and he speaks with a clarity because he knows, he knows that in times like this, we're ne we are culpable of neglecting praise. And so he says, your only hope in this life or the one to come is the glory of God. So praise the Lord. Let's read Psalm 115. This is a, a loose poetical translation. Not to us, but to your name, O Lord, be glory and fame. Your love toward us knows no end. Your faithfulness, my close friend. Why should nations proudly laud? In heaven there is no God. Our God is in heaven still. From there you dispense your will. Their God is silver and gold. God's mere human hands did mold. God's with blind and sightless eyes, whose ears never hear your cries. Offerings they cannot smell, no voice to say, it is well. No hands to touch, heal, restore, no feet to run when called for. The idols greatest betray, 
to make you as dead as they. Israel, trust in the Lord. He is your shield and your sword. Holy priest, trust in the Lord. He is your shield and your sword. Tongues and tribes, trust in the Lord. He is your shield and your sword. He has remembered our plight. Clouds of blessing now bursting bright. All Israel, he will bless. All tongues and tribes, he will bless. He will bless his holy priest. All who fear from great to least. May the Lord give you increase. On your children, blessings release. Blessed by the God of all worth, who alone made heaven and earth. The heavens are his domain. The earth he grants us to reign. The dead declare not his praise. Idols have cut short their days. But we shall bless Christ the Lord, our great eternal reward. Praise the Lord. How does, how does a person pray in a situation like this? Well, if we Listen to the psalmist today. We're going to find a very powerful prayer for COVID-19. It's not original with him. We've heard it before. We will hear it again in the Bible. I'm amazed that as you just survey the prayers of the Bible, how powerful they are and oftentimes how unlike they sound to most of our prayers Today, the prayers of Moses, the prayers of David, the prayers of Solomon, the prayers of Peter, the prayers of Paul, the prayers of Jesus himself. And the psalmist joins these other people in this beautiful prayer. And he doesn't he doesn't say, God, change my situation. He doesn't come and say, God, I've I've got a strategy right here. I think this is pretty good. I want you to work on this because he knows, verse 3, he knows that our God is in the heavens and that he is dispensing. He does all that he pleases. We don't need to inform him. He doesn't need our advice. What a comforting thing to consider right now in these dark times that our God is in the heavens still, even amidst COVID-19. Our God is in the heaven, and he does all that he pleases. In the midst of evil, in the midst of tragedy, God's still on his throne, and God is still doing all that he pleases. COVID-19 has no power over him. Evil has no authority over him. Death has no reign and no final say. God alone has the final say. And the psalmist knows this. He knows that these are evil times and and that it seems that evil is running amok and that it's winning the day. But he knows that God is in heaven and that God is doing all that he pleases. And so he prays a most appropriate prayer. He says, God, you rule the heavens, and the earth. And I'm looking down here on the earth and I'm seeing the evil that's taking place. And God, my prayer is not that you remove me from the evil. My prayer isn't that you remove these people for their sake. God, there is something that I see right now on the earth that is breaking my heart. And it's that the nations are looking at this as an excuse to taunt your name, to defame your glory. Verse 2, why do the nations say, where is their God? Israel, if your God is so good, why is your life so bad? It seems to me that you're just stuck in this little fairy tale. Why don't you just admit that If there was a God, he certainly has no power over this world. And isn't it so easy to hear the taunts of the world today in the midst of this tragedy? Isn't it so easy that if we're not careful, those taunts even come from our own hearts? The world would say, well, I'll give you one of two things. Either God is all good or God is all powerful, but he can't be both. 
I mean, COVID-19 teaches us that God can't be all good and all powerful. The mass graves and all the deaths that are taking place teaches us that God can't be all good and all powerful. The separations of families and friends teaches us that God can't be all good and all powerful. Do you see that? Do you hear that today? Recently, I watched a video from the governor of New York. He says this, the number is down because we brought the number down. God did not do that. Faith did not do that. There are a great many things that the psalmist can handle. The psalmist can handle suffering. The psalmist can handle exile. He can handle economic crisis. But what he cannot handle is the defaming of God's name. And there are many things that we can handle today as well. We can honestly handle COVID-19. We can handle a shrinking bank account. We can handle separation from friends. We can handle not being able to go back into the country that we love. We can handle not being able to pack up our belongings. We can handle not being able to say goodbye. Does it hurt? Yes, but we can handle that. But one thing we cannot handle is that God's glory would be defamed. And so the psalmist prays a most appropriate prayer right here. And he calls us to join him in that. Verse 1, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. God, move on this earth in such a way that you shut the mouths of all the scoffers. Do something so powerful on this earth that it is uncontroversial. No one can deny that our God is in heaven and he does all that he pleases. God, put things right. Not for me, not for the nations, but for you. I wonder, has your prayer life been like that? That is a powerful prayer for us to pray. But if we're honest, uh, perhaps we've not been praying that. You know, it's, it's one thing to pray to God. And it's quite a different thing to pray for God. To pray for the glory of God to be manifest in the world. And it reveals something in us, does it not? If, if we only ever pray to God for God to fix our needs for God to do something for us, if that's all we ever pray about, then it reveals who our true God is. It reveals that we're coming to God because he's going to dispense something to us and that he really is like any number of other idols that we could have chosen from. We just choose this one because we think maybe he's going to give us what we want. I, I've seen people do this. I've seen people pray to Yahweh, our God, who sits on the throne in heaven, the God who does all that he pleases. But I've also seen them go to the temples and burn incense, just in case. And I've also seen them carry around good luck charms, just in case. And I've also seen them do crazy, superstitious things based on their culture, just in case. And we're no different. Is it God we're after or simply solutions to our problems? Are we willing to bow down to whatever is going to give us what we want? Or are we like the psalmist coming to God, not so that he can give us what we want, but because God is what we want. And in our prayer, we say, God, we want you and our desire is for you and our greatest desire is for the world to know you and for your glory to be manifested so come down and do something not for me not for me but to your name give glory that's that's the prayer of the levites in nehemiah stand up and praise the lord your god who is from everlasting to everlasting 
Blessed be your glorious name. And may it be exalted above all blessings and praise. You alone are the Lord. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cries at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh. Against all the officials. Against all the peoples of the land. For you knew how arrogant the Egyptians treated them. Listen to what it says. And you made a name for yourself. Their prayer was that God would make a name for himself, that the world would see the goodness of God. That's the prayer of Moses. When Moses is in the desert and God is going to punish the people, Moses doesn't come and say, well, God, you know, they're, they're pretty good people. They're, they're just a little misunderstood. He doesn't come and say, God, just give them one more chance because they, they kind of deserve it. You know, they're your people after all. Listen to what Moses says. Moses said to the Lord, God, the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power, you brought these people from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of the land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people. And that you, Lord, have been seen face to face. And that your cloud, your glory stays over them. And that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, the fire, the glory, and a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land. He promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now, may the Lord's strength be displayed. This is the prayer that we want to pray at a time like this. God, display your strength so that no governor might say, God didn't do this. So that no mouth could open and say, where is your God? Because we know where our God is. You are in the heavens and you are doing all that you please. Come and reveal yourself, not just to us, but to the world, not for us, but for you, because you are worthy to be praised. So be careful. Pay attention to how you pray, because your prayers reveal what you really love. The psalmist loves God more than anything else, and it's evident in what he says. Verse 1, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Verse 9, O Israel, trust in the Lord. Verse 18, But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. If your prayers are always only God deliver me, then you realize that what that is teaching you is that you have become an idol unto yourself, that you are what you love most. And if your prayers are only, always, God deliver my friends and my family, then you realize that that is revealing to you that your friends and your family have become your idol, and that is what you love most. Now, I, I don't want to pit God against humanity here because the Bible says the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he says the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor. The Bible doesn't pit one against the other. It's not either or. My point is simply to say this. If your prayers have an absence of God, have an absence of of the glory of God, it is a warning sign to you that you are not worshiping God alone. You know, earlier we sang a very dangerous song. I wondered if you paid attention to it. I wonder if you sang it without even thinking about what you were singing. For your glory, I would do anything. Really? I, I think Moses would sing that song. I think Moses did sing that song, Show Me Your Glory. Moses was so enamored with the glory of God that he says to God, God, if your glory stays in the desert and doesn't go into the promised land, then I just want to be in the desert 
because I'm not looking forward to a land. The promised land isn't my great hope. I'm looking forward to a person. And I'm not looking forward to lands flowing with milk and honey. I'm looking forward to your glory flowing into my life. So whatever you do, I'll do anything for your glory. Please show me your glory. Do you mean it? A.W. Tozer once said, Christians don't tell lies. We just go to church and sing them. For your glory, I would do anything. Would you joyfully suffer through COVID-19 for God's glory? Would you be content to be separated from your family for a season so that God might, in some strange way, get glory from it? Would you be content with not being able to go back to your apartment not being able to say goodbye to your friends because you know your God is in heaven and he does all that he pleases and he is doing something to get glory. So God, I'll do anything for your glory. If in some crazy way God was most glorified, if COVID-19 lasted another six months, another year, would you say, bring it on? I will do anything for your glory. Glory, please show me your glory. Would you be willing to suffer through the death of loved ones if it meant that God would be glorified through their death and many people might come to know him? Would you be willing to suffer death yourself to experience, to participate in the glory of God? Jesus was. This psalm right here is a psalm that Jesus sang in the upper room the night before he died. He sang it, not to us, not to us, but to your name give glory. And the song turned to a prayer later, John 17, as he goes to the garden and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Lift your son up on the cross that the nations might see me and behold me. That's how you're going to glorify me, that the Son may glorify you. The song turned to a prayer, which turned to the cross itself. Though you slay me, yet will I hope in you. Though you slay me, yet will I praise you, do whatever you need to do in order to bring glory to your name. I would do anything for your glory because the glory of God outshines all the other glories that there are on this earth. And there are other glories. There are other idols that we could go to. But the glory of God is greater. I mean, it's like a little firefly compared to the flames of the sun. God's glory is so much greater. Listen to how the psalmist describes the other glories of this earth. And again, there are other glories that even we could turn to. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in thermometers, Others in hospitals, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in masks and others in government bailouts, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And the, the, the psalmist says of those other lesser glories, our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases, but, but their gods, their idols are silver and gold, the works of Human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. They have feet, but they do not walk. Do that. They do not make a sound in their throat. And the psalmist wants you to compare. He wants you to compare your God to all the other gods that you could bow down to and worship and give glory to for you to realize that that our God 
is our only hope. And the glory of our God is our only protective covering by which we should ever come under. And he's saying in dark times, don't abandon God. Don't abandon his glory for some second rate deity. They have mouths, but they do not speak. But our God does speak. He speaks tenderly to you in your suffering. He speaks words of hope. They have eyes, but they do not see. But our God does see. He sees your situation. He is El Roy, the God who sees. He's the God who looks and beholds even the tiny sparrow and cares for him. How much more does he see you and care for you? They have ears, but they do not hear. But our God hears your cries. Our God hears your prayers. Our God hears your frustrations. They have hands, but they do not feel. Oh, our God has hands. Hands that reach out and touch you and bring healing to you. Hands that feel. Our God has hands that felt the nails go in them. And do you suppose that our God, who, whose hands feel, our God, who is in heaven and does all that he pleases, was pleased to come to earth and pleased to, to feel the pain of the nails going into his hand for your sake? He was pleased to do that. Do you suppose that maybe he's got good plans for you, even though you don't see it right now? even though you don't feel it right now. And so the psalmist can confidently say in the midst of his trials, the Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. There is this confidence in the reality that God is going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something. I don't know how he's going to bless you, but I know that it's going to be a blessing and not a curse. I don't know how he's going to increase you, but I know that whatever that increase is, it's going to be good because it's going to be an increase of his glory and his presence given to you. And the psalmist, remember, these songs are sung during Passover. He's thinking back. All, many of these psalms are going back to the Exodus. And he's thinking back to the Exodus, Passover, the very first Passover that was celebrated, a celebration of freedom celebrated by slaves still in Egypt. And they had a staff in their hand ready to march out because they were confident that God was going to do something. And they ate unleavened bread because they said, there's no reason, there's no point of putting leaven in that. He's going to send us out so quickly, the bread's not going to have time to rise. They were confident that God was going to do something. And the psalmist thinks back to that and says, we need to have that same confidence. And he speaks to the people in their darkness and says, have this confidence. He will bless you. And he speaks to us today. Have that same assurance. Celebrate your deliverance even before it happens. At the very heart of this psalm is verses 9 to 11. It's right in the center of this psalm. And it's, it's indicating to us that this is the big idea behind the psalm. Everything else outside of it is meant to support verses 9 to 11. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. O oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is your Help and your shield. The glory of God is your shield. Think back to the Exodus as the people left Egypt and they were at the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his army were bearing down on them. What happens? Exodus 14, the pillar of cloud, the glory of God 
moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. The glory of God is your great defense. And the beauty of the gospel is that when you seek the glory of God, you are seeking your own goodness. Because God's glory fights for you and does something for you. He speaks of being the shield. The glory is our shield. He is your help and your shield. Jesus is your shield of protection. The blood of Jesus covers you and protects you. A shield is, stands between you and an enemy and it takes on what should be yours. It takes on the beating that would have been your beating. It takes on the pain that would have been your pain. And our God who has hands, who does feel, not like a shield that doesn't feel, our God who feels takes on the pain for us and he surrounds us with his glory. He fills your pain and covers you with his glory that you might be able to endure any amount of suffering through this time of darkness. Look again to the heart of this psalm. O Israel, trust the Lord. He is your help and your shield. This is a, a call and a response. O Israel, trust the Lord. He is your help. And your shield, two groups of people that are singing back and forth one to another. If you've ever been to a sports game at a, a big stadium, you've probably heard this before, where the fans on one side begin to scream something, and the fans on the other side scream something else. Beijing, Beijing, Guan, where I'm from, Arkansas, Razorbacks. The people of God are surrounding each other, and they're saying, Trust in the Lord. He is your help. He is your shield. This is a call and a response. And in times like this, we would be wise to remember the call to spur one another on to faith and good works. He speaks to three people. He says, Israel, trust in the Lord. Priests, trust in the Lord. All those who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. And so I want to end our time with just a, something very practical. I think it, it, it's, it's very um, pertinent to this psalm. I want you just to take a few minutes right now to think of three people that you can send a message to. Maybe it's on WeChat. Maybe it's typing. Maybe it's a voice message. Maybe you want to send a video message. Maybe you want to call them. But three people that you can do a call and response and encourage them to continue in the glory of God. Continue seeking Him. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't bow down to idols. Our God is in the heavens and He does all that He pleases. So I'm going to give you some time right now just to do that. And I'm going to do that as well. So let's just take a few minutes. Let me end our time by me encouraging you. Call and response. City church, family, trust in the Lord. He is our hope and shield.
pastors, church leaders, ministers, trust in the Lord. He is our hope and our shield. Anyone here today who wants to trust in the Lord, who wants to come under the the shield of His glory, trust in the Lord. He is our help and shield. Praise the Lord.